Hey what's up guys, so today I'll be showing an easy DIY guitar gear build. Sitting on top of my amp here is an attenuator, and what this does is it essentially soaks up power from the amp before the signal reaches the speaker, and this allows you to crank up the amp to its sweet spot while also keeping the volume down to a manageable level. But another benefit that many of you might not realize is that these can also improve the signal to noise ratio as well. So let's first talk more about what an attenuator is and how it can be used, and then after I'll be giving some helpful tips in case you want to build one for yourself. So the main reason why some guitarists use attenuators is because many tube amps and especially vintage style amps sound their best when they're cranked up. Not only do they sound better, but for many amps, cranking up the volume is the only way to get an overdriven sound. It wasn't until the 1970s when some amps started to get a master volume knob which allowed you to crank up the gain independently from the overall volume. So for amps that have a master volume, an attenuator isn't as useful as it is for the more vintage style amps, but even so, amps with a master volume do tend to sound better and more full with the master volume cranked up also. So it turns out an attenuator is still useful for these as well. Now that's the primary reason why most guitarists use an attenuator, but like I said, there's also an additional reason, and that's for reducing the white noise, or in other words, the background noise, which can vary from amp to amp, but it turns out the number one amp that can benefit from this more than anything else is the 68 Deluxe Reverb Reissue, which is what I have here. These amps have gained a reputation for being noticeably noisier than their vintage counterparts, but they're still excellent sounding amps, especially if you swap out the stock speaker like I did, and they're still very popular with gigging musicians despite this noise problem. There's actually a couple of reasons for the noise problem, and fortunately, all of these problems can be solved with modifications. And I'll actually be making a video when I get around to doing these mods on the amp. But it turns out an attenuator is also a really great solution for the noise problem as well. This is because the noise is introduced into the circuit pretty late in the signal path. If the noise was injected right at the beginning of the signal path, then increasing the volume would also increase the noise at the same rate as the guitar itself. But fortunately that's not the case here. The noise stays roughly the same as you increase the volume, which means it's not such a big deal when you have the amp cranked up. This is probably why it's still a popular choice for gigging musicians. Chances are they have the amp cranked up to at least 5 or 6 for live shows, which means the guitar will be much louder than the noise. But if you want to use the amp at home, then chances are you're not going to crank it up that loud. Setting the volume to around 2 is more than enough for bedroom practice. But the problem is that you're going to be getting a similar amount of noise when the volume is set to 2 as if you had it cranked up to 6 or 7, which means the signal to noise ratio is much worse at lower volumes. It's actually pretty bad if you're sitting right next to it like I am right now. But this problem can be overcome by cranking up the volume and using an attenuator to bring it back down. So let's do a quick comparison to demonstrate what I mean. Here you can see I did two separate recordings in my DAW. The first recording was done without an attenuator and the amp's volume was set to just under 2. The second recording was done with an attenuator and the amp's volume was set to a little over 3. The attenuator was adjusted so that the guitar's volume is roughly the same as it was without the attenuator. The gain on the microphone was set pretty high so that you can easily hear the white noise and I also rolled down the guitar's volume knob so that it doesn't clip the mic. So now let's hear the recordings. Here's the first one without the attenuator. As you can tell, the background noise is extremely noticeable. Now, here's the recording with the attenuator. Mm -hmm. 
Not only was the noise much lower in this one, but it was actually difficult to exactly match the guitar's volume with the other recording. So it turns out the guitar is actually slightly louder here, which just goes to show how well the attenuator is helping here. Not only is the guitar signal louder, but the noise is also drastically cut down. Now let's hear how it sounds with the guitar's volume turned up and the amp's volume cranked up to around 7 with the attenuator. It sounds pretty nice, doesn't it? I'll give another sound demo at the end of the video. So now let's go over how you can build your own, but I won't be going over every detail since I already covered most of the details in my three-part series showing how to build your own guitar pedals. These videos are in my DIY guitar gear playlist, which I'll link in the video description. Even though an attenuator technically isn't a guitar pedal, it's still extremely similar and the process is more or less the same. So instead of going over all of that again, I'll just be going over some helpful tips that are specific to this project. So now let's head over to this article from guitar.com which explains the project in detail. I'll also leave a link to this in the video description. Now the attenuator I made is based on the same one described in this article but with a few modifications. So let's go over the different components of the build and I'll also point out the changes I made along the way. You can see this is an extremely simple circuit. In fact, it's so simple you don't need to make a strip board or a PCB. Instead, you can simply do point to point wiring for everything. So let's start by talking about the L pad, which is the main component of this build. An L pad is basically a big potentiometer, and it functions pretty similar as a volume pot. Turn it clockwise to increase the volume, and turn it counterclockwise to reduce it. The reason why it's so big is because it uses a resistor network to soak up the power from the amplifier before it goes to the speaker, which means all those watts get dissipated as heat. You can see this L pad is rated for 100 watts, which means it technically can soak up 100 watts from the amp, but in reality, you wouldn't want to do this for an extended period of time because chances are it's gonna get really hot. To be on the safe side, I'd limit the watts to roughly half of its rating. So if you get a 100 watt L pad, then personally, I'd only use it with up to a 50 watt amp or smaller. If you want to save some money, you can also find 50 watt L pads, in which case I'd only use it with a 25 or 30 watt amp at the most. And even if you do limit the wattage to half of its rating, chances are it still might get pretty hot after extended uses. That's why it's recommended to drill a bunch of holes in the enclosure like you see here, and like I did on mine. This will ensure the L pad gets some airflow and doesn't overheat. Also, now's a good time to address the elephant in the room, which is the ridiculously long shaft that mine has. Don't be a dummy like me and make sure you buy an L pad with a shorter shaft. When I purchased mine, I didn't realize I got one with the extended shaft. When I received it, I just tossed it in the closet without even looking at it, and I didn't get around to building the attenuator until about a month later. And at that point, it was too late to return the L pad. So I ended up just rolling with it, despite how ridiculous it looks. But anyway, even though an L pad works the same way as a volume pot, the way it adjusts the resistance is different than a regular pot. When you turn a regular pot, the resistance across its terminals changes as you turn it. But with an L pad, the resistance across the terminals actually remains constant according to what it's rated for. In this case, you'll want to go with an 8 ohm L pad since that's what most speakers are, and that's what most amps expect to see on their output. But of course, some amps also have 4 and 16 ohm outputs, which is why you can also find 16 ohm L pads. But if you want your attenuator to be compatible with 4 ohm outputs, then you're better off just getting an 8 ohm L pad than adding an additional 8 ohm power resistor that's rated for 50 watts. 
When two resistors of the same values are put in parallel, their effective resistance gets cut in half. So since the L pad is rated for 8 ohms and so is the additional resistor, their effective resistance becomes 4 ohms when they're wired in parallel, which makes it compatible with the 4 ohm output on the amp. The additional resistor is connected to an on-off switch here, which allows you to select between 4 or 8 ohms. Now I originally included this additional power resistor on mine, which is what these holes were for. But I ended up removing it because, well, I never used it. All my amps have an 8 ohm output, so it was pretty pointless for me to include such a large power resistor. So I ended up removing it, which freed up some room in the enclosure for me to add some other components, which I'll talk about here in a second. But now let's talk about the two other switches that are here. The first switch is a simple on-off switch. When it's flipped on, it engages the circuit. And when it's flipped off, it completely bypasses the circuit and connects the amp directly to the speaker. Now the other switch here is a treble switch, or in other words, a bright switch. One of the drawbacks of using an L-pad is that it's a purely resistive load as opposed to a real speaker which isn't purely resistive. A speaker is actually a coil which means it has inductance, and this also affects the frequency response. And what you'll likely find is that the sound is slightly darker with the attenuator, which is why it's common to include a bright switch with various capacitor values to help bring out more treble from the signal. In this example, they used a three-way switch with two capacitor values, a 2.2 microfarad cap and a 4.7 microfarad. When the switch is in the middle position, the bright switch is off. And when it's flipped to one side, it engages the 2.2 microfarad cap. And when it's flipped to the other side, it engages the other cap. The higher the cap value, the brighter the sound will be. Now in my testing, I found the 2.2 microfarad cap didn't really make a noticeable difference. And overall, I found it to be kind of pointless. So I ended up leaving it out and just used a two-way switch with a 4.7 microfarad cap which does give a noticeable difference. Now you can see here the article suggests to use non-polarized electrolytic caps. Keep in mind most electrolytic caps are polarized, so you'll need to make sure to use non-polarized caps. Now, while electrolytic caps are perfectly fine for audio, they're not the best choice. So if you want the absolute cleanest audio, I recommend using film caps instead. However, the problem with film caps of values greater than 1 microfarad is that they start to become physically large. Here you can see the 4.7 microfarad cap that I used for my build takes up a lot of space, and I likely wouldn't have been able to fit it if I kept the power resistor in. Now like I said, the point of the bright switch is to try and make the tone more like a regular speaker as if the attenuator wasn't there. This is because an L-pad is a purely resistive load, unlike a speaker, which is technically a coil and has inductance. So in order to make the attenuator react more like a speaker does, I recommend adding an inductor to the circuit like you see here. This will improve the tone and make it closer to how you'd expect it to be. I suggest using a 220 micro Henry inductor rated for 3 amps like the one I purchased here from eBay. This should be fine for amps up to 50 watts, but if you plan to go higher than 50, then you'll likely want to use an inductor that's rated for more amps. And finally, the last tip I have is use an appropriate gauge wire. I used old speaker wire for mine, which is around 16 gauge if I recall correctly. I'll also leave the link to this wire gauge chart that shows how much current a given wire can carry depending on its gauge and how many strands it has. Since my wire has quite a few strands, it looks like it can carry around 6 or 7 amps, which is actually overkill for only 50 watts, but it's better to overspec the wire than underspec it, which can lead to overheating and voltage drops. So that wraps up today's video. As you can tell, an attenuator is a relatively easy build, and I highly recommend it for any guitarist that has a tube amp. If you have any thoughts or questions, feel free to drop a comment and be sure to subscribe to the channel for more DIY guitar gear content. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.